Welcome everyone to this online SLE seminar uh, that will be given by Tibold Skrepel uh, from Utrecht and Stanford on a topic at the intersection between loan economics and antitrust. A long awaited seminar that, that was supposed to take place in physical presence uh, many months ago, uh, but given the evolution of secondary uh, situation, we have decided oh, wow. to hold it this way. Oh, and uh, you. and uh, uh, thank you. Please uh, stay muted uh, during the presentation and, and unless you're, you're, you get the floor from the chair. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, so if any of you is uncomfortable with this, because it will be put online as an ECD meeting, we have a great opportunity to have a wonderful discussion on a great topic with a, with a very mixed audience. So we didn't want to miss this. Uh, but if you feel for any reason uncomfortable with that, please uh, feel free to, to switch off your camera. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the man that made this uh, seminar up and despite the pandemic, uh, my colleague and friend Jan Bruding, Assistant Professor of European Law at Amsterdam Law School and a research member of ACLE. Uh, Jan, thanks for making this happen. And he will share the meeting. I will look forward to this. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Alessio, uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen from Amsterdam. Welcome to this online research seminar organized by the Amsterdam Center for Law and Economics. Uh, my name is Jan Brolik, and I will be moderating this seminar, as Alessio mentioned. Uh, but the, the main figure today is our speaker, Tibor Trepel, whom I would like to sincerely welcome among us. And let me uh, introduce him briefly. Uh, Thibault is an assistant professor at Utrecht University, uh, and he holds also affiliations to other leading institutions, including, for example, Stanford University and Pantheon Sorbonne. Most of Thibault's writing focuses on the issue of innovation and digital markets in relation to competition law. He is particularly known for his work on blockchain and competition law, which is also the topic of his today's presentation entitled Blockchain Antitrust Competition Law Without Firms. We are extremely happy that Thibault accepted our invitation. Uh, for your information, the seminar was originally scheduled already for the spring. We postponed it because of COVID, uh, hoping that it could soon take place on site, which clearly has not worked out. But we believe that this online alternative will also prove productive. Before I give word to Thibault, uh, let me mention that his presentation will take about 30 minutes, after which there will be time for questions. If you do have a question, you can click on participants at the bottom of your Zoom window and then on the blue button called raised hand, raise hand. Uh, you can also type your question in the chat. That way uh, we can have a bit of a organized uh, discussion. And after, after Thibault's talk, I will give you the chance to ask your question orally. We have time until quarter past five Amsterdam time. Uh, so it's about 70 minutes. And now over to you, Thibault. The digital floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Um, again, I'm very happy to be with you, whatever it means now in the new age. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't meet in person this time, but, but I'm sure in the future we will. Uh, but the good thing is that I will be discussing a topic which relates to digital markets and this blockchain. So at least we figured how to make Zoom work because it's always nice when you discuss something quite complex and you cannot even manage to, to deal with the software. So we achieved that. So I'm very happy for that. Um, so again, thank you lots for the invitation. Without further ado, I will, I will share my screen right now. Again, I will be giving, giving you my thoughts on the, on the issue of antitrust and blockchain for about half an hour. Um, and then I look forward to, to, to the questions. Um, so uh, let me share my screen uh, right away. Okay, so this should work. Um, 
to share screen. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. we can see it fine. <clears throat> All right. So here's what I want to do. I want to discuss two things. They are, of course, related. The first, I need to explain what is a legal fiction uh, and what, what I mean by that. And especially since apparently some of you are not coming from the legal words, uh, I know that <clears throat> it's a concept that might be obscure and I have the experience of a, of a conference discussing with uh, blockchain developers. And that when I said legal fiction, they thought I meant something else. So I, I just want to make that clear. And then, uh, as you can see, there are actually two subparts, uh, but that will actually depend on you. And it will depend on the question that I will be asking you in a minute and on your answer. And I will change the, the course of my talk according to the answer you'll be giving me. But the basic overview is this one. And what I mean by that is that hopefully we can move from the left to the right. The left is the way I think we look at, as we call them, undertakings in competition law or the firm. So what we do is that we look at it from above, right? Because we see the firm as being a vertical structure organized towards different objectives. And I think that this doesn't work when it comes to blockchain for reasons that I would explain today. So hopefully uh, we can agree that we need to move on the right, which is to look at blockchain from not from above, but trying to understand what are the different layers and what's happening precisely within, within the blockchain, which is something that we don't do in antitrust. So that's the idea that where you stand is what you see. Um, and again, I think the way we've been applying competition law has been working fine, but potentially for blockchain, there, there is an issue and that's the subject of my, of my talk. Here's the question that I want to ask you. Instinctively, would you rather have control over a business infrastructure or not? Knowing that you want to do business within that infrastructure, but I'm asking you if you want to control the infrastructure, which could be anything. It could be a legal infrastructure. It could be a digital infrastructure, whatever, whatever you want the meaning of that infrastructure to be. I'm asking you whether or not you want to control it or if you prefer to give control to someone else. And to answer the question, it's quite easy. You have a few options. You could go to uh, slido.com and then you enter the even code ACLE and you can answer the question right away. Or if you want, you could take a picture of, um, of the QR code, which is on the left. And one last thing that you can do is click on the link that I'm putting in the chat right now. So of course, I will now wait for five minutes for you, for you all to answer the question. If you feel like answering the question, please do. And again, I will change the course of my talk depending on your answer, because I think it, it deserves a different explanation. So this is what I wanted to do before I start. But while I wait for your, for your answer, what I want to do is to explain what is a legal fiction. So a legal fiction is not that, at least not that I'm aware of. And this is, again, this, the, the meaning of, of a fiction, right, in our everyday language. A fiction is something that doesn't exist. I'm not aware that ghosts exist. Potentially they do, but as far as I know, they don't. And so therefore, a ghost is not a legal fiction. So what is a legal fiction? And here, I know it's, it, it might be provocative a little bit, but on purpose, I took the definition from Wikipedia because it is decentralized. And this is the subject of my talk today. A legal fiction is a fact that is assumed or created by court. And the reason why it is assumed or created is that thanks to it, we can actually achieve a certain objective. And that objective will be to apply the law um, and towards achieving something else. But without the legal fiction, we cannot apply the law. So a legal fiction is, is a fact that is deemed to exist because it is convenient right, for us to apply the law. So let me give you an example of a legal fiction. And if you haven't read that book, I believe that it is now um, accessible on, on, on Google, uh, somewhere on a few websites in open access. This book was published in uh, 73, uh, published by uh, Christopher Stone, who's a, a, a law professor in the United States. And he wrote a book called Should Trees Have Standing? Or differently said, should trees be a legal fiction under our legal system or not? 
And he's making the point in the book, and this has been the basis not only for trees or the environment, but for lots of uh, new legal fictions, that a legal fiction should be created for the purpose of achieving three different things. The first is that the injury to the legal fiction should be taken into account. It should be that the legal fiction can actually institute a legal action on its behest, which is something that otherwise would not be possible. And the third point is that relief must be run to the benefit of that legal fiction. So if I give you an example, a market is not a legal fiction. Why is that? Because the market cannot uh, put a claim before a court and ask for relief you know, in the name of the market. It doesn't exist. And on the contrary, a firm is a legal fiction. If you are the CEO of the firm, you may uh, uh, bring a case before the court and seek uh, damages in the name of that firm. So the firm is a good example of a legal fiction. Of course, this is nothing new and we, we have not waited for 73 to create uh, firms as legal fiction. Uh, if you go back to the roles of the British Parliament, you could see that already. So the English language here is a bit weird, but basically what it means is that hospital back in the, in the 15th century were recognized as legal fiction already. And of course, the firm is a good example. And there is a great paper, Corporation is a Person, that was published in 87, that explained exactly what it means that a firm is a legal fiction, right? And the idea, again, is that we said that firms were legal fiction because it was convenient for us to apply, especially business law. So that's the idea of a legal fiction. So the question is, of course, why not creating lots of legal fiction, right? because it's so convenient and so easy then to apply the law. And there are two reasons why we may want to create legal fiction sometimes, but some other times we do not want to do it. The first is a uh, philosophical uh, reason, and that was raised by uh, Jeremy Bentham, and he called legal fiction the stealing of legislative power. And indeed, if a court is saying that this is legal fiction and the thing can bring damages and so on, well, it means that the court stole power from the parliament in a sense. And if the parliament is saying that a firm is a legal fiction, you could also say that the parliament is stealing power from the people or uh, from the court. So that's one. But I think most importantly, when you create a legal fiction, you want to make sure that you can achieve that result in a way that it's consistent with the rest of all of the other legal fictions and the legal system. If it is not consistent, then it is problematic. And of course, in the case of the firm, we've been discussing lots, uh, uh, lots of time the issue of that, yes, a firm can bring a action before the court, but a firm cannot, um, for instance, does it make sense to, to discuss uh, rape or to discuss racism when you are discussing a firm? Potentially, you could answer yes, but we see that here it creates some difficulties with the other concept that we have. And of course, once you have created the legal fiction, then you have no choice but to say that it exists. And so you want to think that it's probably not a good idea to create a legal fiction just for because it's convenient in one case, because then it will be there to stay in your legal system. And yet I think that when it comes to blockchain and especially to public permissionless blockchain, we have to create a legal fiction for reasons that I will discuss in a minute. So now let me have a look at the results. Okay, I, I was not expecting that. So for those of you who are not on Slido, 80 votes, no, sorry, 40 wow. votes, and 87% of you <laughs> said that, uh, yes, you'd rather have control over the infrastructure. I know that Jan is trying to identify the person to mute the person. Okay, done. <laughs> yeah, um, sorry. All right, no problem. So 87% of you would rather have control over the infrastructure. So I will then click on yes, you want to have control and let's see what it means, what it means for you, but also what it means for the agencies and especially in the field of competition law. So um, you want control, let's see again, what are the consequences of that? But before I enter that, I need to ask you the last question of the day and then it will be your turn to ask me questions. I want to ask you, what word would you use to describe blockchain? If you're not familiar at all with blockchain, I think it's probably even better. Uh, and if you are familiar, of course, you will know that choosing only one word is very complex. 
to answer the question, you could go to the same link or again, take the, the, the capture of the QR code uh, on the screen right now. And then you will be free to use the word that you want. And I will be using that to see what are the consequences of, of your description of a blockchain potentially. Okay, so you said that you want control. So if you want control over the, the, the infrastructure that you are using for business, I think that what you want is a firm. And we know that, and especially in the field of, of competition law, we know that from the work of Ronald Coase. And you may be familiar with Ronald Coase, is a, um, a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he actually wrote his paper, as I'm about to, to explain, which is called The Nature of the Firm. And he wrote that paper in 37, so quite a long time ago. And yet this is still the basis for pretty much everything that we do in the field of competition law which might be surprising, but to some degree, I think that it works. So why creating a new theory? I think what is remarkable with this paper is that he wrote the paper when he was 21 years old uh, with no mathematics, and yet it is one of the most cited paper in the history of economic theory. And potentially it is because it is actually very simple and very elegant. Um, in this paper, Ronald Coase is asking a very simple question. If markets work so well, then why do we have firm? Why not just everyone being on the market and transacting freely without the constraint of being within a firm? And his answer to that question is also very simple and elegant, which is, which is why I think that paper has been so influential, is answering that the reason why you may want to transact within a firm and not within just the market is that potentially for some transactions, not all of them, but for some of them, you will save transaction costs. So he is not using those words of transaction costs in that paper. It was uh, actually um, uh, used almost 30 years after, uh, but that's the idea of Ronald Coase. Sometimes it is actually great for you to save the costs that you need to engage before transacting with another person if you do it within a firm. And, and there it is key, is, is then asking the question, why is that? Why can you save costs within the firm rather than just being on the market? And the reason is that a firm is vertically organized and a firm can exercise a power of command and control. Let me take an example. Let's say that you are my manager. We work for the same firm. You come to me and then you say, hey, Chibo, today I want you to do that. First of all, most likely, unless you have lots of employees, but you knew who I was already, so you didn't have to spend lots of costs to identify the best person uh, for, for that type of task. You do not need to negotiate a contract with me because we work for the same firm, so you could just ask me to do something, and you do not need to, 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 ne to negotiate or to spend time convincing me that it is in my best interest to transact or to do the thing that you are asking me because you are my manager. And if I don't wanna get fired, I will do the thing. And this is what Ronald Coase is saying in his paper, the idea that a firm, the top of the firm can direct resources and that allows to save some cost. Of course, this is not perfect. And you have then the work of a novel, another Nobel laureate in economic, uh, uh, Joe Stiglist, who then wrote about all the issues that, uh, that occur when the top of the firm is giving an order and when those orders trickle down, down the firm, there are lots of issues. But still, at the end of the day, you can save costs. So why am I telling you all that? Well, I'm telling you all that because this is pretty much all that matters in competition law for us to determine what is a firm or as we call it in Europe, an undertaking. But it's actually the same in the US. In the US, they had one case, which is a famous case before the Supreme Court, the uh, Copperweld case, in which they discuss what is a firm. And some people were saying, well, a firm is not only that you work for the same entity, is that you have the ambition to achieve the same goal. And that creates a firm. But actually, the Supreme Court rejected that, saying it's not, it's not even true. Uh, potentially, it should be, but we know that you know, there are always some colleagues that you don't appreciate as much as, the, as much as the others. And potentially, you know, you may want to compete with them to get a better position and so on. So that idea of reaching the same goal is not what matters, at least not in competition law. 
the only thing that matters to determine an undertaking is whether or not you are being controlled by the same top, by the same group of persons. And that we know also, uh, we, we see that also very clearly in Europe, in European competition law, from a bunch of cases where we know that only control does the firm. And if you are being controlled, you may have two different legal entities registered everywhere you want. But if you are being controlled by another entity, then you are the same firm for the purpose of competition law. So in that matter, it's actually quite easy. Of course, the question is, what is control? So if one firm owns 100% of the share of another firm, the other firm is being controlled. If that is not the case, we can discuss. But that always relates to that idea of control. So the theory, in short, of Ronald Coase is the basis for modern competition law. So I know that since Ronald Coase, we have we have lots of different theories to explain what is a firm. On the left here, uh, it is uh, Michael Jensen. On the right, it is Oliver Hart, uh, who also won the Nobel Prize in economics. They both develop slightly different theories explaining that a firm is a nexus of contracts. So it's basically a bunch of contracts. And if you combine them overall, it will create, it will create a firm. It's very interesting. I think it is especially relevant when it comes to blockchain communities. But as far as competition law is concerned and the firm, it is not relevant. We do not take those theories into account. Uh, long story short, but I actually discussed with, uh, with one of them uh, that issue and, uh, and he regretted that indeed in competition law, Ronokos is still you know, the only thing that matters and not their theories. So why is it important? Well, first of all, it's important because it's good to know which legal fiction you will apply competition law to, right? Otherwise, because a legal fiction is here to be convenient, otherwise, without that uh, conveniency, then you cannot apply competition law. But it's also very interesting and, and helpful when it comes to applying competition law itself. And here's what I mean by that. Let's discuss collusion between two companies. So collusion, for those of you not specialized in competition law, the idea is quite simple two separate entities, two firms coming together and agreeing on doing something, changing their behaviors on the market for the purpose of doing something illegal, which will hurt consumers. If they are separate entities, then a collusion is possible. But if they are two separate entities, but one control the other, once again, they are the same firm for the purpose of competition law, and therefore there is no collusion possible. So it's never possible for a uh, a, a firm to agree on doing something illegal with a subsidiary because they are the same firm and one cannot agree with itself. And the same is true for abuse of dominant position, which is the other category in competition law. Again, for an abuse of dominant position, you also need two firms, but there it's one firm abusing its power over another one. But if those two entities are part of the same firm because one control the other, since you cannot abuse your dominant power against yourself, then there is no Article 1 or 2 of the TFEU. So you see that it is not only the basis for legal fiction, but also for the way by which we apply competition law. So in the end, competition law applies to you if you have a firm, but it also means that competition law protects you, right? If you are the firm being abused by another one, then you can say, please apply competition law. There is an abuse of my competitor's dominant power, and I, need, and I need damage or I need the practice to stop. So now let me say that you've changed your mind because of everything that I've been discussing, because again, you said that you wanted control, but now you see that if you want control, it means that you will get competition law being applied to you as well. And if you follow a little bit of field of competition law, you know that now the fines are several billions euros for, for certain practices. So let's say that you do not want competition law after all. So then the question is, do you, want, do you want to use a blockchain? Or in turn, do you have control still if you use a blockchain or is there no control at all within the blockchain ecosystem? But first I need to have a look at your results. So the keywords that you've been using to describe a blockchain. So I've seen immutable distributed ledger, so that I will explain in a minute, but I think they are very much relevant when it comes to control, uh, digitalization, okay, technology, uh, collaboration, 
Well, the idea of collaboration and control here again is, is interesting. Uh, data integrity. Okay, that one is a bit different. I guess we could discuss that. Um, decentralization, again, will relate to control. I will explain that in minutes. Decentralization, distributed ledger. So it seems roughly that 60% of you are using the keywords that in the end relates to the idea of control. So let me have a look at whether indeed those uh, the sixty percent of you were right to say that you wanted to to if, that you had to use a blockchain if you want control over the infrastructure. So I need to be very brief here, and I have only ten minutes to go. But I would still need to explain what is a blockchain. If I want to do it in just ten seconds, a blockchain is an infrastructure. So it's it's a ledger. It's a database that functions according to certain key characteristics. And once those characteristics are put out there, it's very hard to change them. But basically a blockchain, once it is put online, can be used for the parties to transact, to exchange information and so on. So the reason why I'm mentioning that is that of course, it relates to work of Lawrence Lessig and the idea that digital architecture are very important because they shape our behaviors. But it also means that if you want to discuss algorithm, if you want to discuss AI, robots, or the internet of things, in the end, all of those could function on top of a blockchain. But if they do, and if you actually look at the survey, lots of those developers are saying that they are programming new internet of things types of services and products on top of blockchain, but then they will be constrained by the blockchain characteristics. So if there is no control, it means something for them. But if there is a different type of control, it also means something for them. Here's a blockchain. You may have seen that. I know this one has been criticized, but still I think it is relevant for understand what is a blockchain. On the left, you have a centralized network. Let me say that it is Facebook. Facebook is at the very center and Facebook can do two things. Fe Facebook first is the only one to have all of the data, the data of all of their users. No other parties have as that data. And also Facebook can control that data. Facebook could tomorrow decide to delete a picture from your account, could decide to prevent you from accessing your, your Facebook account and so on. A blockchain is decentralized. And by decentralized, I mean something that relates to the idea of control, which is the one in the middle. With a blockchain, potentially if you want, and especially a public blockchain, you can, if you want, download the copy of all of the past transactions that ever happened on the blockchain, which means, of course, something very important when it comes to the value of data. But it also means that since you have the copy of the blockchain on, on your computer, the question is, can someone still delete that copy? And the answer to that is negative. And a blockchain on top of being decentralized is also distributed. And here it relates to the location of data. And indeed, as I just said, all the data from, for, for the entire blockchain could potentially be located on the computers of all of the, of the users using that blockchain. And that of course means something. It means that a blockchain has been designed in a way to get rid of control. And that's something that Vitalik was the creator of a, of a large blockchain tweeted just a few days ago, control as liability. And that's the idea. And to tell you the truth, when I went to the MIT Media Lab, where now the uh, Bitcoin Foundation is being located, so you have all of the people designing the Bitcoin core software. And when I discussed all that, the number one thing on top of their, of their mind was to say, but if we do that, we're going to have control. And we do not want control because control equal liability. And we do not want to you know, hear about competition law, antitrust, data protection, and so on. But my question is, I mean, really, they do not have control. I'm not sure if it is that easy. But that we, what we know still is that potentially there is control within a blockchain ecosystem, but there is something for sure, which is that control is not vertical. It is not possible for any of the categories of blockchain users, whether they are core developers, users or miners, and I will explain in a minute what they do, but none of them can actually decide to force another category to do something. They could change the blockchain in a way to push them towards something, but it's not the same as within the firm. So it means that you cannot say to someone who designed a blockchain, well, I see a competition law infringement, 
Therefore, you should be liable because you could have control of the practice. It's not true. So potentially there is control within a blockchain, but it's not again a vertical control, meaning that the theory of Ronald Coase, vertically organized so that you can save the cost, does not apply. So we have a big issue. We could discuss whether or not this is true for consortium blockchain. I do not want to enter to enter that right now, maybe during the QA, but I think it is also to a degree. So and again, something that I want to mention is that, well, you could, you could say, well, okay, the legal fiction of the firm doesn't capture the way a blockchain function, but what about the other legal fictions that we are using in competition law? And the association of undertakings is one of them, but I think it doesn't work, again, more than happy to go into detail during the Q&A, but an association of undertaking is a bunch of companies with separate economic activity competing with one another. If you look at within a blockchain, some users may be competing with one another, but overall they do not always have a separate economic activity. And sometimes they do want to achieve the same results. They are not in a competition at all, quite the contrary. So I think it doesn't work as well. So we know that competition law does not apply to blockchain, right? At least not to the layer one blockchain because there is no vertical control and this is the basis for defining the legal fiction and here it doesn't work. So my question is then, well, what should we do? Should we just say that there is no competition law for blockchain? Because indeed no control equal no firm, so doesn't work for blockchain, equal no competition law, equal no liability, at least not, not liable in terms of competition law. But the issue, or potentially it's not an issue, but if you look at some, uh, some uh, pronostic for the futures, of course they may be wrong, but th those are two big firms, Bain, Bain and Company and PwC. Both of them estimate that blockchain in and of itself will actually increase all of the trades, the global trade, trade all over the world by, according to Bain, $1.1 trillion, which is an increase in almost 7% in the total of transaction all over the world. And according to PwC, it's uh, 1.70 trillion. And that was just published in October, right after the corona, I mean, after, in the midst of the corona crisis, unfortunately. So do we really want to have 7% of world transaction with no competition law applied to that? I'm not so sure. That led Mackandel Rahim, who's at least for now running the uh, DOG antitrust division, in a recent speech to say that it is vital for antitrust enforcers and agencies to understand blockchain, because again, it could be the infrastructure for lots of transactions on top of it and functioning based on the characteristics that I've just uh, explaining. But my question is really, is there no control within a blockchain? Or if I go back to the question that I asked you, you wanted control, so should you use a blockchain or should you stick to the firm? This is what I've been discussing in the paper. You may access the link. It was also in the, uh, in the presentation of this seminar. And in that paper, I've done my best to try to enter the blockchain and to see if really there is no control at all. And what I got from studying lots of different blockchains is that we have three categories of participants. I guess we can agree on that. The core developers, those are the ones who design the blockchain and then put it on the web. Then we have the users. It could, be, it could be you and me buying Bitcoin, using the Ethereum for smart contract and so on. And we have the miners, they could also be called validators, who are the one validating the transactions. And if you look, it is true that none of them has a power of command and control. So there is no verticality once again. And none of them just by themselves can actually control the other or force the other to do something. Because indeed the four constraints, and I do that again from Lawrence Lessig, the market, the social norms, the law and the architecture, exercise some constraints over those categories of users, meaning that they can do a little bit, but they cannot control the blockchain. But what you notice is that if you study most blockchain very closely, and I believe it is actually true for all of them, that sometimes two of those categories of users or part of those categories will come together, will collaborate. And if they do, then what you notice is that some of the constraints that I've listed on the table does not apply to them because they are not actually in check and balance with the power of the other group. 
And if they do that, eventually they exercise a form of control over the blockchain. And again, I believe that uh, Balash is in the room and, and I think it is very much relevant for us so, uh, to, to study what's happening in terms of social norm, in terms of trust. So it means that we need to study law and economics plus the technology, plus also those sociological questions. I know it's a lot, but I, I believe we have no choice. So I want to go fast on this one. But again, if you enter a blockchain and what, what you see is that if those categories of users, they come together, they will actually be able to exercise the three powers that I've listed on the screen. They can actually have a, a very limited power of command and control. They could change the economic value of the blockchain. And if you can do that, then you can control a little bit the blockchain and you can influence the norms, right? You could, you could, you could say that if you do something on a blockchain, it's great or it's not and vice versa. So in the end, and this is certainly true for, for the Bitcoin and the Ethereum and a few of the blockchains, Stellar and so on, what you see is that a group of users are coming together because they want control eventually. Of course, they potentially do not want competition law to be applied to them, but what they want is to be able to maximize the chances that the blockchain will survive. It's not enough for them, for them just to say, well, it's decentralized and distributed, there is nothing we can do, especially if they, are, they, have, they have invested lots of time and money into the blockchain. And that I believe this group of users creates another legal fiction to which we can apply competition law again, because we create a legal fiction. If we do that, there is then an inside the legal fiction and then outside the legal fiction. So you could say if two, as I call them, blockchain nucleus, those group of users are collaborating with one another, then you can apply uh, the TFEU article 101 and, and vice versa. So here I've listed all of the practical use and what I've, what I've tried to do is to then go through all the case law that relates to market definition, market power, analyzing practices, and to see if with that group of users, we can actually make it function. And I believe that the answer is positive. What it also means is that then you can actually protect that legal fiction, right? Those users coming together can be protected. And if they suffer, from a anti-competitive practice coming from another blockchain or from a firm, then potentially they could bring a, a, a claim before the court and, and ask for damages. I'm, I'm almost done. What I want to mention is that of course there are many challenges and I'm looking forward to your questions. What I've not been mentioning in this talk is that I've been only talking about what is called the layer one blockchain, which is the, the, the infrastructure and the rules that applies to the blockchain infrastructure. But once again, you may then design any software that you want and put it in, on top of the blockchain. And that software will function in a decentralized way. For those software, of course, if you are the creator, you can still control the software and do lots of different things. So I'm, I'm not discussing all that in this talk, just the layer one. I've not been mentioning, but this is a fascinating issue, the issue of the DAO. So those are decentralized autonomous organization. So those are the equivalents to firms, but they just, just function using smart contracts on top of blockchain. This is technical, happy to answer your questions. I've not been mentioning all of the mechanisms that you could use to actually recreate kind of a governance that resemble the governance of the firm within a blockchain. It's also very relevant. And of course, the issue, the issue of enforcement when it comes to competition law is a relevant issue. So my conclusion is that still within a blockchain, what you do not see is vertical control, which means that rule of cause does not work, but you do see control, right? Some users will actually control or greatly influence the other users. And for that reason, I believe that we can create a legal fiction uh, to act actually capture and encapsulate those users. So since you answer almost 90% of you that you wanted control, well, potentially you may use a firm, but you may also want to use or design a blockchain of your, on your own. Control will be different. And again, if we look at it from above, what we've been doing in the field of competition law, we will not be able to understand what's happening and it will be problematic, but you will get a certain type of horizontal control over the other users. 
So this is all I wanted to say. Of course, there's lots to say regarding the topic. If you want, all of my papers are accessible open source on that website, blockchainantitrust.com. One last thing that I want to mention, and of course, I've been discussing the issues that blockchain creates for competition law, especially for competition agencies and for lawyers. But I think there is another side of the story, which is how blockchain could actually help antitrust agencies to do something and to improve their processes and their analysis. If you are interested in that, studying how the technology could help antitrust agencies, uh, please be in touch because this is, I think, something that is not being discussed enough and, and that could be relevant. Again, the DOJ in the United States is now looking at blockchain very closely. Uh, I believe that some other agencies all over Europe are. And, and for that, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a happy ending in a sense, because I was not expecting that two years ago when I, or a few years ago when I started to do blockchain in, uh, research in the field. So thank you for being patient. Thank you for all of the keywords. I've seen a few new keywords, anarchy, mathematics, that will be worth uh, discussing, but I'll be pleased to do that during the Q&A or, or by email. So thank you. Well, thank you, Thibault for a very rich presentation that walked us through uh, many things, including legal fictions, the, the notion of the legal fiction, the theory of the firm, and uh, the blockchain as well. I do not see any raised hands or any questions in the chat, but I would like to invite everybody who wants to ask a question to signal that. And maybe I kick off uh, with a question of my own, which is, largely uh, motivated by the fact that I still do not entirely understand the technology of blockchain, what it actually is about. But, you know, throughout your presentation, the, uh, the thing that kept uh, appearing in my head was, how is this different, let's say, from the internet? So when you ask the question, can competition law apply to blockchain, how is that question different from asking, can competition law apply to the internet? Yes. Um, yeah, if you can, maybe I can f elaborate later, but maybe sure. if you can take it from, from here. No, I think, I think it's a really relevant question. And I recently read a book that was published with the MIT press. It's called uh, Pirate Utopias. And it's a bunch of papers that were published in the 90s regarding what they called the cyberspace or the internet back in the days. And some of them are asking that question. Can we apply the law to the internet? And you have two papers, and if you haven't read those, those are two of my favorite papers, the law of, of the horse and the response that has been written by Lawrence Lessig. In the first paper, Easterbrook was arguing that there is no law of the internet. It doesn't mean anything because at the end of the day, companies will be using the internet and we can use and apply corporate law to those companies. So the internet law doesn't mean anything. And Norman Schlesig answered and said, well, it's not true because the internet actually brings something totally different. And it means that if you want to apply the core legal concepts and corporate law is one of them, then what you need is special regulations to enable those core legal fields to be applied in the first place. And this is what we've seen to some degree. We've seen lots and lots of specialized law regarding the internet. And I think that issue and, and, and that divide is even clearer when it comes to, to blockchain. Potentially, I guess you could argue that blockchain may do to transactions what the internet has done to information. So uh, of course, we know that the internet changed the way by which we exchange information. What we have seen back in the 90s is that it will also change the nature of information, right? More videos and TikTok and all that. Potentially the same is true for blockchain. Uh, what we understand now is that it will change the way by which companies transact, but it could also change the nature of those transactions. And one of that could be that it will not be a bunch of firms. Of course, it's possible for a firm to use a blockchain. And if that is the case, then everything that I've been discussing is not relevant because we are here at a different level, right? We are at the level of, of users using blockchain to transact. There are lots of enforcement issue, but if we have just blockchain as a third institutions, which will be along the firm and the market, 
if you see people transacting using just the blockchain outside of the firm and market, then you may want, again, to, to find a way to apply competition law to those. So in a sense, this is where it's, it's different again from the internet. The internet could be used to exchange information, but at the end of the day, there are users and companies using the internet to exchange information on top of it. For a blockchain, it could be that a transaction happen within the layer one level. And there, since it is the infrastructure of potentially 7% of world transaction, you may want to find a way to apply antitrust and competition law to that layer. So I hope I answer your question that way. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I will follow up uh, maybe before. I see that Balaj has a question, but maybe if I can follow up on this because it directly uh, concerns your answer. I'm, I'm actually, so you mentioned that the reason or why, how internet is different uh, here is because you see blockchain as a third alternative to uh, markets and firms, but that's still not entirely clear to me why I shouldn't understand blockchain as simply something that just decreases transaction costs because the as then as I said I'm still not entirely clear on what it actually means to use blockchain but to me it seems that it just uh, somehow allows us to transact uh, in a more efficient way so it allows us uh, to make certain transactions automatic, which probably means those we, we would want those tra transactions to happen anyway. It's just the thing does it for us. This technology does these transactions for us. So I would intuitively understand uh, blockchain as simply a technology that somehow lowers transaction costs. Uh, and yeah, I see that Balash is uh, signaling that uh, I do not understand blockchain. So maybe if you can people briefly explain why I am getting it. So, um, and then we will proceed to these other questions that uh, started appearing in the chat. Sure. I mean, so the idea that yes, blockchain can reduce transaction costs is true for certain transactions, but also for other transactions, if you need help to learn how to design a smart contract, uh, it will increase the transaction cost. So I think the idea that blockchain will replace firms, it's not entirely, I mean, it's not true because for certain transactions, the firm will be still the best way to reduce transaction costs. But to some degree, I think you're right. But I mean, let's say that we are, we, we, are, we are two companies. We may use a blockchain to transact. And in that case, yes, you can apply competition law to us, the two companies, right? But now let's say that we are not companies. We are just, you know, um, uh, entrepreneur acting freely on the market. If we use blockchain to transact, then what are we, right, on the market? And, and that is an interesting question. And that is the reason why you may want to find a way to apply competition law to our transaction, which is actually to, to, to the way we use the blockchain to transact. But that is just one part of the story. This is just us using blockchain to do something in the outside world, right? To transact, to exchange goods and so on. Most of what I've been discussing today is not actually in us using the blockchain to impact the outside world, it will eventually, but it's about the way the blockchain function, the blockchain itself. And since blockchain could become the infrastructure for lots of transactions, you, I think you may need to apply competition law to that infrastructure, whatever that is, right? So again, here it's about how, if you are a miner and I'm a user, if we transact in a certain way to improve the blockchain, to change it, what's happening? How do we apply competition law to that? And that I think is a very interesting question. So again, I would like to draw a distinction here between using blockchain for something in the outside world or using blockchain or just, you know, trying to modify the blockchain and make it, make it survive uh, for the sake of it. So. Okay, yeah, thanks for the explanation. That makes more sense to me now. And uh, we still have 25 minutes roughly. And I see people started uh, posting their questions in the chat, but I will probably it will be best if I give them the possibility to ask them orally. So, Balash, if you can ask your question. Yeah, so uh, what, I, what I'm curious about, and thank you for this overview, uh, is that uh, especially permissionless public blockchains pride themselves to be the closest uh, implementation of the economic uh, free market competition ideal, um, where everyone is a price taker or everyone is a rule uh, taker. And uh, uh, 
Uh, but ultimately, the three groups that you also identified, the miners, uh, especially the miners and the developers, are actually uh, continuously coordinating. Uh, you may say that the coordination mechanism is very simple. It's a take it or leave it choice. You either uh, accept these rules or you leave and start your own blockchain. Uh, but uh, we know that there is uh, more coordination taking place through informal channels. And uh, I was wondering whether it's... Uh, Antitrust uh, uh, from within the competition law uh, tool set. This is the antitrust, uh, 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 the right approach, or maybe cartel. Uh, can you say something about why open blockchains are not cartels? Sure. In some sense. Um, yes, a, a paper has been written on the subject. <clears throat> it, it is called uh, 21 million different cartels to refer to the Bitcoin. So here again, I would like to draw a distinction between. Uh, using the blockchain to collude in the outside world, right? So, for instance, we use smart contract to collude about the prices of our products in the supermarket or colluding about the way the blockchain itself functions, which seems to be what you are referring to. So there is one case in the U.S. currently uh, that has been introduced, and I think it's before the Court of Appeal, uh, in which... Um, so I'm going to try not to get too technical for, for in case... Uh, we don't have some blockchain specialists in the room, but in that case, um, uh, some of the blockchain community uh, wanted to increase the size of the blocks for reasons that we know, because it might be easier, it may go faster and so on. Some other parts of the blockchain community wanted to remain with the same size of the block for other reasons that are perfectly valid, right? The two reasons are valid. And of course you may want to say, as you just said, it's take it or leave it, right? So in a sense, there is no possibility for you to voice, at least not in theory. All you may do is to exit the blockchain if you dislike the new blockchain. But what happened in that case, supposedly, is that part of the blockchain, which wanted to increase the size of the block, knew that they were too little compared to the other one. So yes, they could have forked the blockchain and create a new version with the new size of the block, but no one will use it and it will die. So what they've done, supposedly once again, but, but it seems that they agree that they've done it, is that they've rented computer power from some servers in China. And they've rented that for, I think, three weeks, if I recall, uh, so that once they forked the blockchain, they will get more computer power and you know, it will send a strong signal that this is the version of the blockchain to be used. And it is now a case, uh, a case in the US in which the other part of the blockchain community is saying, well, this is a cartel, a cartel between one part of the blockchain community and those Chinese servers and companies running those servers. We will see. Um, so far, it has been it has been rejected, um, uh, but we will see if if they succeed. Uh, ideal, I mean, in in a sense, I think it's an important question because it asks for whether the way because of of course you could say a blockchain is just a collusion, right? It's just a bunch of person by definition binding by this, paying by the same rules. And so potentially everything could be a collusion, but there, and it will be a very interesting question. And unfortunately I don't have the perfect answer, but we know that from the field of competition law and antitrust, that collusion are fine. Collusion are not illegal, but anti-competitive collusion are illegal. And the standards to judge whether a collusion is anti-competitive or not is whether it hurts consumers. So, that's what you're going to have to prove, right? You're going to have to prove that part of a blockchain community is colluding and this is hurting consumers, not just your personal interest. Uh, and this, this I, I believe, it's going to be where the case flow is going to be decided in the coming years and then we'll get some rules and some standards. Uh, but potentially it's a very, I think it's a key question, but I, I think blockchain community should not be too worried that just taking part in the blockchain is just an anti-competitive collusion in and of itself because it benefits consumers. Uh, so uh, in and of itself, not anti-competitive, but potentially, yes, I agree. Uh, if you see core developers and miners, and we know that you know, they have each other uh, phone number, if they phone each other just to agree on implementing some changes, if you can prove it hurts consumers, yes, potentially you have, you have a case there. So this is the first case, one of the first cases in the United States. I'm not aware of any case in Europe, but I'm sure it's coming. Okay, do you want to follow up, Balas, maybe? Uh, no? 
Okay, uh, so then we have two questions in the chat, but the author of one of those sent me a message that he's retracting the question. So uh, maybe uh, I can ask uh, Jacopo Zona, our student, who has a question which, as far as I understand, also concerns this external perspective on uh, on blockchain, which seems to be the way that people not trained in, you know, not not dealing with the technology that often we seem to focus on what it's useful for the and and we ask those questions. So maybe Jacopo, if you can ask your question, if you're here, I can read the question. Otherwise, it's fine. Okay, I can I can read it. I don't see Jacopo in participants list anymore, so I can read it uh, for everybody. Uh, yeah, it was the question: Could an agreement between companies competing in the same sector to use blockchain to perform transactions between them be considered as efficiency under Article One Hundred One Three? Yeah, um, I think it would be hard, uh, but you may want to try. I mean. So let's say two companies are using a blockchain to collude, and I think indeed it will be smart for them to do it, unfortunately. Uh, but potentially you could set up a better collusion using smart contracts. Uh, and if you were to do that, uh, to be considered an efficiency, the way the, the way the case law is being framed, you will most certainly fail. Then, of course, it's a prediction, so I do not want to say that and then see the first case and it will be granted. But, it's, but it seems to me that again, here, if you have two companies colluding, it is efficient for them to use the blockchain to collude. Yes, it is. But at the end of the day, it is efficient for them too to extract consumer surplus in a way which is not pro-competitive. So I think it will be hard to make the case that it is actually good for consumers that you colluded in a way which was great and, and, and really efficient. You may want to try, but you know, to, to what you said, uh, Jan, the fact that uh, uh, if you are not familiar with blockchain, you may see it from the perspective of using blockchain to impact the outside world. I, I was expecting the first cases to be, to be about that. To some degree, you could argue that the very first case of blockchain antitrust in the United States is a case that concerns precisely that. You had one person who was uh, on uh, bitcoin.org, which is a forum on, uh, uh, you know, that you could use to share ideas about your new project and so on. And that user has got ejected from the forum because of his behaviors. And then he argued that his, his uh, ejection from the forum was actually an infringement to Sherman Act section one, which in Europe is TFEU article 101, saying that he did not have access to the great developers and to great ideas. And so in a way, it was a way for the Bitcoin.org users to collude because they were scared of, of his good ideas. And it was a way for them to collude to exclude that person from being able to put a great blockchain on the market. Of course, it failed, potentially not for the right reason, but it was a, it was a long shot. But it was indeed, as you said, a case in which blockchain, you could see the interaction between blockchain and the outside world. Uh, but then the case that I mentioned to Balash is a case which is regarding the way the blockchain itself uh, function. It's probably not the easiest for competition agencies, but not surprisingly in the US, it wasn't a competition agency. It was a private litigation. So of course, you know, it's just a matter of luck. I would be surprised if competition agencies in Europe would start by litigating something which relates to the way the blockchain function. I think it will be important in a few years because if it becomes the infrastructure for lots of transactions, it might be relevant to, to make sure the infrastructure is working as it should. Uh, but potentially, potentially it's a better idea to start with, uh, you know, two companies using smart contract as uh, Jacopo just mentioned uh, for colluding in the outside world. So, so I, I wanted to share my reaction because I, I was a bit surprised uh, regarding that case. Yeah, no, that's uh, actually quite fascinating. I was wondering maybe if you could give us further examples of, you know, how actually practically blockchain can be used to collude. So how is it different from, you know, the companies just communicating through any communication channel and then carrying out what they have agreed on. How, what does blockchain add? So, you know, like an a word of advice for 
companies that would like to start colluding using blockchain? Sure. Uh, what I should say is that at the end of the day, what matters is trust, right? You need to trust the other colluder or colluders that they will not deviate, that they will not go and apply for leniency and so on. The question is, is blockchain creating trust or impacting trust in one way, in one way or the other? And I think the answer to that question is positive, but what I want to make very clear is that I do not believe that you can solve the, the human trust issue just by using blockchain. Technology cannot replace the fact that at the end of the day, it's still about humans right behind their computers. That being said, I think where it's interesting and it's probably a difference, uh, a distinction between blockchain and just using algorithm to collude is that we know that if two companies collude to achieve something illegal, let's say to raise their prices, it's anti-competitive and it's prohibited, which means that they may have a legal contract between them, but the legal contract is worth literally zero, right? None of the two companies can go before the court or the agency and say, hey, we had an agreement to do something illegal. That person has not respected the agreement. Therefore, you should you know, find the person. It's not working, which means that collusion between companies are always non-cooperative games, right? So here, this is pure game theory. It's non-cooperative because, of course, they want to cooperate to achieve something illegal, but they cannot actually bind the other colluder to collude with them, right? There is no way to, to bind the other colluder to achieve that. So that has been true for the history of humankind. But potentially, you may see to a degree that blockchain is changing that. If for your collusion, what you do is that you use a blockchain, and especially smart contracts, of course, you, it's not, not still, you cannot go before the court and say, we have a smart contract, it should be enforced. This is not working if it's anti-competitive. But what you can do is that to a degree, you could bind the behaviors of the other colluder by the way of the code of the smart contract. It raises lots of questions regarding protocols and how they function and, and everything. But at the end of the day, still, you may predict to a degree the behaviors of the other colluders because you know that a smart contract is running and will automatically execute. And so to a degree, it's changing collusion into, from non-cooperative games into cooperative games. And, and that, I think, is a challenge for competition agencies. It means it, the translation of that for competition policy is that you may see uh, less leniency applications. We know that they are declining already for the past 10 years in the US and in Europe. You see that they go down. And potentially with blockchain, they may go further down because if blockchain lead, leads towards more cooperative games, why would you deviate, right? Why would you apply for leniency if, you, if everything is working according to the plan? It will never be perfect, but I think that's the trend and that's why competition agencies have to be more proactive. And for that, they have to mean more, you know, a, a greater budget to be able, not just to rely on leniency application, but to go and investigate markets. So at the end of the day, it's a bit of the entire ecosystem that could be challenged. So sorry for mm -hmm. being long, but, uh, but I, I liked that question. <laughs> okay, yeah, the, those are nice thoughts also because we have quite a lot of our students here who are currently thinking about their thesis topics. So, uh, and I know many of them are interested in uh, new technologies, including blockchain. Uh, suddenly a couple of questions uh, showed up. So uh, let's, yeah, we have 10 minutes. So maybe let's, try to be concise in asking and uh, answering those. First, uh, well, there are actually two of them and then a comment in the chat. So maybe we can still spend some time on the questions. The first one will be by Reese. Reese, please ask your question. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm also new to blockchain, but I'll, I'll make it concise. Um, I, in dealing with um, the sort of bank cartels case, cases sort of around the world, where I just thought there's some similarities here where there was allegations um, that, you know, the major banks colluded to fix currencies. And even though it was a, a stretch, I'm sure you're well aware. And I was just thinking that even if, um, say, big companies are proven to be uh, collaborating um, to sort of undermine a blockchain in some other way, how would 
quantifying of damages work and would it actually be easier or more challenging? Um, that's my question. Yes, so here, I, I think it's a, and indeed it's a relevant question, but I, I would say the first step is first to convince blockchain communities that yes, if competition law is being applied to them, which part of it is rejected, uh, is rejecting, it also means that they will benefit from competition law. And this is the example that you are giving us, right? A few companies doing something to try to destroy a blockchain. Well, if you have no legal fiction, uh, then what do you do? What, I mean, you cannot you know, go before a court and ask for, for damages or protection and, and so on. So I think the first step is, is to agree on the needs to create a legal fiction. It could be a totally different way from the one I've presented, but I think this is a necessity in any case for competition law. Once we have done that, the question of, of damages is going to be a really hard question. And, and somehow it's related to the way by which we defined uh, the relevant markets and especially market power. How do you compare market power when it comes to blockchain? Some are saying that we should have a look at the number of users. Some are saying that we should have a look at the number of transactions. I think at the end of the day, you could, you could have a look at the value of all of the transactions, which is what the European Commission is doing already, right? They say market share as a proxy. We know that from the Google case and so on. And so potentially if you recreate a legal fiction and you try to see all of the transactions that they can control and the value of those transactions, potentially it means that you may find a way to compare those legal fictions with one another and market power. And it also means that, you know, you could, you could prove damages. You could say, well, look at that. Uh, we, you know, the nucleus of the blockchain was controlling for worth 10 million euro transaction. Then whatever company came and, and has done something to us, uh, which will be complex by the way, but but let's say that it is possible and uh, we do not control 10 million, but 5 million. So the damage has to be five. Uh, overall, it will be way more complex because again, we are dealing with the centralized communities uh, and, and those issues are more complex than just asking the company what's the turnover and you know, trying to see uh, with the counterfactual what has been the damage, which is already quite complicated. Um, and we know that from the Google cases in which there is almost no counterfactual because it's really hard. When it comes to blockchain, I think it will be a level up in terms of uh, difficulty. Okay, so uh, the next question from uh, Mattel. Mattel, please, if you can. Yeah, thank you very much. I you, I'm a colleague of uh, Tibor, not all of you know me. So also, hi Tibor, and thank you for the presentation. I teach uh, financial law here in Utrecht. Uh, so uh, I was uh, um, uh, comparing a little bit your uh, granular uh, uh, approach to what is normally done when it comes to anti-money laundering. There, there is also this similar uh, concern that you cannot really tackle a, a blockchain as such. So you have to focus on some of the participants. So when it comes to anti-money laundering, now the idea is to uh, focus uh, on each individual, uh, let's say, component of that complex organization, if I may call it like that in a very generic term. So the idea is that you should apply that, that set of rules to the miners on the one end, and you should do that uh, to the wallets, for instance. You should do that to the oracles. Uh, so my question, but, and, and uh, this overall idea is in line with the, with the understanding that each of these components can uh, actually qualify as a firm. Yeah. So back to your point, I was wondering what really prevents us from uh, considering, for instance, miners as firms on their own. They actually provide a service to the whole infrastructure. So the service of certifying that a certain transaction occurred. The same applies, of course, to oracles when it comes to embedding uh, external events uh, into the system and this, uh, I mean, and so on and so forth. So I was wondering uh, why sh couldn't we just stick, let's say again, to the good old idea of, uh, uh, of a firm? <laughs> sure, uh, well, it's nice to see you, Matteo, uh, even though it's online. Um, so to your question, um, so, so first of all, there is a difference um, between uh, anti-money laundering, I think, and the way the blockchain function. And the difference, and that will be part of my answer, is that 
potentially you are not in control of the blockchain or you know uh, the entire activity if you're a part of the blockchain. If you are just a miner, you control what you do with your computer, but that's about it. You do not control the blockchain. So the idea that, yes, you could impose some rules on, on each of those categories of users, but those are not, those are just rules, right? For them to have a good behavior. But this is something different from competition law, since you cannot impute liability on someone who has no control over what's happening. And this is part of my, this is the other part of my answer, which is that it is true that let's say you are a miner, uh, yes, what you are doing is an economic activity. For core developers, it's, it, it's less clear, users even less, but for miners, it's clear. It's an economic activity. So potentially, yes, you can apply competition law to that individual, right? So to miners, you could apply competition law. I mean, they have no impact over the blockchain, so what would you? But it's possible. But I think where you need a legal fiction is when you want to understand and to tackle the practices not happening at the individual level between just you and me to miners, but the practice is happening at the blockchain level, right? When the entire blockchain is going in a way which is potentially anti-competitive. And for that, you need that legal fiction. So again, there are two different levels here uh, between individuals and, and the entire blockchain, whatever that is, where I think we need a legal fiction here. So. But it's a fascinating question. So it's nice to see you. And uh, I hope we could discuss a bit more. Yeah, of course, we will have time. Thank you very much. OK, uh, so the last uh, point uh, will come from Paolo, who, um, yeah, who will elaborate on what he wrote in the chat, or he will at least read it to us. Yes, good evening to everyone. Uh, it's not really a question, but it's just something I was pondering for some time, um, especially about uh, the interaction between machine learning and uh, blockchain technology, especially in the field of smart contracts. Because as you said, uh, the smart contracts transform a non-cooperative game into a cooperative game. And if you would include also uh, machine learning um, where is actually the machine, the computer or the algorithm that does the thinking for you. I think it is, uh, there would be no more human interaction. So the, for example, the problem of collusion would be a whole different problem. And so I was thinking, what are your thoughts on the combination of machine learning and uh, the use of blockchain? Sure. Well, it's also nice to see you in a long time. Um, what I would say is that um, overall, I mean, for now, I'm not aware of any smart contracts in which you could actually combine that with machine learning or unsupervised algorithm or deep neural network, all that. It's probably coming, right? I, I believe that eventually it will be possible to govern smart contracts using those. So far, I'm not sure if it's possible. At least it's not being widely used. I think overall, you may want to, I mean, I'm not sure if you could actually if the reasons for which you may want to use machine learning to collude or blockchain are the same. The reason why you may want to use machine learning is overall because you think that the computer will find the best way for the collusion and will achieve the best results that way. The reason why you may want to use a blockchain is because you have the best way. You know that the price has to be eight instead of six, but you are not trusting the others that they will actually bind by the rules and therefore there you may want to use a blockchain for for the trust issue and the trust reason of course they could be combined you could combine trust with the algorithm finding the best way but i mean this is a far future and um, it's it's a fascinating research question for antitrust agencies um, probably not the the issue that they will have to deal with in the coming month or even years i would say but thanks thanks a lot for the great question Okay, so I think that's it. Maybe one practical question that showed up in the chat. Uh, and if I understand the question correctly, it's asking where one can uh, find links to papers about issues uh, related to those that we discussed today. So Tibor, I suppose if people go to your uh, personal website, uh, tibolschapel.com, they can find a lot there. Would you recommend any other places? 
Sure. So that's one, as I said at the end of the talk, and I'm putting the link in, in the chat right now, you can also go to blockchainantitrust.com where I've put all of my papers. I need to upload a few more videos and podcasts, but that's, that's and, and I'm not the only one, you know, and, and for that you go to Google Scholar and you will find some great papers, uh, uh, including regarding smart contracts. Uh, so uh, yes, you see an explosion in the field so it's definitely a field to, to watch, I believe. But if you are interested, please feel free to send me an email, especially once again, if you are interested in how technology and especially blockchain could help antitrust agencies. I think this is the other part of the story, which is also interesting. And thanks everyone for the great questions. And okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, we're really at the end of the seminar. Our time is up. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge the great effort of the people from the Amsterdam Center for Line Economics who helped organizing this. So uh, Alina, Nina, Alessio. And I would also like to thank all our participants for their attention. But most of all, I would of course like to thank our speaker, speaker Thibault. So uh, Thibault, thank you for, for your <laughs> great performance. And uh, yeah. I wish everybody a great rest of the day.